Hello, everyone. My name is Susie Davis, and I am a proud graduate of BU's College of Communications. I'm also a proud BU parent. My son is a student at Questrom Business School. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's discussion called My Journey, Inventor, Entrepreneur, and Creator, featuring BU alumnus Aaron Rasmussen and moderated by Professor Jerry Fine. It really is incredible that our alumni audience is joining us from more than 31 states and 20 foreign countries. Um, thank you for your interest in this topic and thank you for participating. Many of you are donors to Boston University and I would like to send a special thank you to you for making programs like this possible. Before I introduce our featured speakers, let me just give you a few housekeeping notes that we need to address. Aaron is looking forward to answering your questions at the end of the program. However, please feel free to submit um, at the bottom of the Zoom. You'll see the Q&A box and you can just hover your mouse over the Q&A box and uh, use that toolbar and you can add your questions even during the discussion. Also, today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be available um, for an on-demand viewing at the BU Alumni Association website. You'll be sent a link and a follow-up correspondence. It is now my great pleasure to introduce today's featured speakers. Aaron Rasmussen graduated in 2006, having earned a Bachelor of Arts in Computer Science and a Bachelor of Science in Mass Communications. Aaron has been able to blend his creative and technical skills in a number of different successful ventures, which include but are not limited to robotics, video games, and education. Aaron first gained international attention across the internet, followed by a visit from the US Army's Experimental Weapons Research Department in his dorm room after creating the world's first sentry gun. He co-created a video game called Blindside that won the most innovative award at the 10th annual Games for Change Festival in 2013 and is currently being adopted for a feature film by Radar Pictures. Masterclass was his first venture into online education, giving people the opportunity to pursue their passions with online classes taught by award-winning chefs, writers, and performers. And now his company called outlier.org is revolutionizing opportunity to higher education with accredited online college courses. Moderating today's discussion is Professor Jerry Fine, the Professor of Practice in the College of Engineering at Boston University. Jerry is a director of EPIC, the Engineering Product Innovation Center. He is also the executive director of Innovate at BU, Boston University's Innovation Center. It is now my great pleasure to turn the program over to Jerry Fine. Please enjoy the discussion. Susie, thank you so much and welcome everybody today. I'm really pleased to have Aaron here. We'll bring him on the stage in just a moment. Before that though, I would like to uh, do my duty as the executive director of Innovative BU. And just note that if the conversation we have today with Aaron inspires you, there's more. On Saturday, this Saturday, February 27th from 10 to three, you're all welcome to attend what we call IdeaCon 2. 2021, a conference for students throughout the country who are interested in innovation and entrepreneurship. It's an exciting day with lots of seminars, lots of uh, interaction with our students. We have over 1,000 students registered from around the country right now. And, and uh, we think you find it really interesting. If nothing else, it's a good way to find out what our student body is interested in right now. Now, having said that, uh, let's move on to the star of the day and let's bring Aaron onto the stage. Aaron, we are so pleased to have you here today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Jerry. You know, I don't know where to start with you. There's so many different questions that we should ask. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, our uh, alumni in attendance will ask some in, in a bit, little bit. But let's start with something really basic. You've had an eclectic, I, I guess we would call it a career. I know you always put it in parentheses. Uh, and have done everything from uh, century guns to video games to high energy drinks, masterclass, outlier.com. You've worked with some incredible people in the process. Um, 
what are those factors that have allowed you to do all of this? You've, you've talked to me in the past about the six factors that made your career. I'm really interested, and I think everyone on, on uh, Zoom would be interested to know, what are some of those things that were really key for you, the key factors of success? Yeah, it's, uh, that's, it's a tough question because I'd love to boil it down to something simple, but it's been a, a whole lifetime, I think, of being very lucky to, to be around pretty interesting people and in pretty interesting situations. Um, you know, so starting with growing up basically in the forest, uh, 12 miles outside a town of 600 people in Oregon, you become very self-reliant because if you want something done, you just have to do it. Uh, somebody was asking me the other day, how did you learn to repair motorcycles? And it's like, well, because I had a dirt bike when I was a kid. And if you wanted it to go forward, when you turned on the gas, you needed to fix it yourself. So, um, you know, there was a lot of sort of self-reliance there. And the fact that my dad was a middle school science teacher meant that I always sort of had this influence in life and a very broad uh, curiosity about the world. So, you know, at BU, I actually got both a Bachelor of Science and a Bachelor of Arts in computer science and mass comm with a focus in advertising. So those, that sort of broad interdisciplinary education was incredibly helpful for me to go out and really sort of figure out what I wanted to do with my time. So in robotics, for example, you know, we made some pretty considerable advances in industrial robots in my first company in doing custom tool paths in cutting granite countertops. We used photogrammetry, we used augmented reality, and we actually made the robot easy enough to use so that somebody who had been formerly running a bridge saw for 12 years, so you know, very sort of manual machine tool, could simply retrain and now run this robot, which factories loved because now you're keeping everyone's job, but you're speeding up output. Well, the advances that we were able to make in robotics actually came from the graphic design and humanities side of my degrees. Because what I did is I looked at it and said, why, why would you need an engineer to run toolpaths? This is basically Adobe Illustrator. Now, sounds funny now, but at the time I was like, Illustrator is like this really easy to use piece of software. And now it's got to be a bit of a legacy piece of software, but I still love it. Um, so basically uh, just that not restricting myself in the broad curiosity has really allowed me one, to acquire the knowledge necessary uh, to go out and do these things. But secondly, to be, I would say less focused. You know, everybody says, stay focused. And I'm like, okay, robots were interesting. Time to just do some art. I wanna make some, some products at this beverages company. So we, we can't talk about sort of the decision factors that I use if that's interesting. That would be, that would be great. Yeah, so, so this didn't happen, I would say until later. Um, because, you know, coming from, there's, there's seven people in my family. My dad was a middle school science teacher. My mom was a homemaker. Uh, my mom actually went back and got her undergrad degree at 45. So not a lot of money going around on a teacher's salary. So, um, you know, I was a Pell Grant student and took scholarships and everything at BU. So my initial businesses in many ways were me kind of going after opportunity where it existed for me. Um, so, you know, robotics, I knew I wanted to be around robots. Um, I'd made this thing that got popular on the internet. Um, the beverages company was really kind of a joke and I have a new rule, which is no more joke companies because you might sell millions of the product and then you have to run it for four years. Uh, but it was a total lark and I had a great time with my co-founder Eli sauce on that. Um, but after that, I really started to think about, okay, well, finally I've got to a spot in life where I can make choices. It's not just kind of going after opportunities as they sit in front of me. So it breaks down into several factors. Uh, when I'm sort of looking at, you know, what I want to do. And I also recommend this to students, well, students, anybody basically trying to make some career decisions. A lot of friends sort of in their late 20s, early 30s were sort of looking at new careers. And number one is, how much money do you want? Do you want it all at once or do you want it monthly? Now, for many people, especially if you have a lot of options, it's all about cutting down your opportunities rather than kind of expanding them. And even then it's about focusing and searching for what you actually want. So if you don't want to make a billion dollars, cool. You now have a lot more options with what you want to pursue. Because if you want to make a billion dollars, um, basically you start a company or you are Eric Schmidt. I think he's the only billionaire that is a non-founder uh, that, that, that came on after. So, you know, those are your two options. And if you're not interested in those, well, don't do them. If you want to make $10 million, $100 million, well, now you can be an early employee at, let's say, a startup. 
if you are happy with a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, and by the way, uh, early in my career, I talked to a few people that you know were sent millionaires, and the number they kept saying is they're like, if I have ten thousand dollars every month after taxes, that seems to be plenty for me. And it's like, well, that's a pretty interesting lesson because now we're talking about you don't need to do anything crazy. You can start to pursue uh, the stuff that might be your passion that doesn't lead in that direction. Okay, so one. So I have to ask the question though: Did, did you want to be a billionaire? Uh, no, no. I um I, I want the option to make anything that I want to create, right? Like at, at heart, I'm an artist, right? So my my background is I started computer programming when I was five. At seven, I picked up a video camera. Um, I had a very clever mom. She said, you know, if you want to play video games, you need to play in an equal amount of time that you program the computer. I'm like, what's programming? So that, that's how I, <laughs> I learned to do that. Um, so no, I, I, I didn't, and I still don't. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see. Um, <laughs> but, but it's really just, I love creating. I love creating these, these big things. I also love creating small things. I've been doing TikTok recently and just doing little sculptures and I, I love this sort of thing. So for me, autonomy is a huge aspect. So it's money. The second is social impact. Is it important to you? Do you want to do it in your job or do you want to do it outside your job or not at all? Artistic expression, obviously a big one for me. Do you want to do it in your job or do you want to do it on the side? Some people don't like putting their art in their job because it ruins it for them. Uh, friends and family, do you want to have time for them? I know people have literally cut that out of their, their lives to pursue their careers. Fifth, power and influence. Are you interested in power? Are you interested in influence? If you don't know the difference, it's Tower in the Square, excellent book about it. Um, but, you know, and if so, what sphere do you want to have power or influence in? And then finally, uh, this is where I just completely forget. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's see, it's power, power and influence and... Um, well, five factors are pretty compelling. It's pretty good, but it was good. It was on the tip of my my brain. Um, let's say money, family, art, social, power and influence. Oh, fame. Not something I'm particularly interested in myself. Some people really want to be famous. And the question is, if you want to be famous, do you want to be famous for the products that you make, the person you are, so you're the brand, or uh, what sphere do you want to be famous in? So what is, sorry, long, long digression there, but I... It's, it's about kind of looking at those, seeing where, what you really want. You know, I, I had a friend who was an actress and she realized after we talked through this, she goes, wait, I don't want to be famous at all. I just like the artistic expression of it. She ended up becoming a producer and produced a film Tribeca. So it, it was pretty fantastic to see if you separate out what your actual desires are, you can focus a little better on your career. So did you, did you make these decisions consciously at age 22? Um, no. So it wasn't until I was about 28 that, that I sort of figured this out. And it started with about four factors. It's since gone to six. But Masterclass was a, a well-considered thing uh, under this framework. So, you know, I'd, I'd done the, so I sold my first two companies and I did the video game with Mike, uh, fellow BU grad. Um, and then, uh, then in deciding whether to go into more VR or do Masterclass, I really thought through all of this. Um, and one of my mentors just gave me some great guidance. That's the other thing is I didn't realize you needed mentors until I was about 27. Um, and that's, you know, I, I think that's just a, such an important part of all of this. I don't know what my problem was. Um, but he said, look, VR, we're not going to have a consumer headset for five years. So if you, you know, want to do that, you should just wait five years and you should do this education thing. So what, what um, caused you to turn your attention away from Masterclass onto outlier.com? Was there a change in one of those factors or is it as a result of something inherent in you? Yeah. So, I mean, I, there's probably the, um, you know, the uh, identifying maybe as an artist. Um, so the goal of Masterclass was to set up, to democratize access to genius. There should be a group of people going around talking to the greatest uh, people in the world at, at their craft, crystallizing that knowledge and distributing it. I mean, when David and I started it, we, we used to talk about how does Aaron Sorkin write a TV show? This is something we want to know. Now, what's funny is we later actually learned how Aaron Sorkin writes a TV show. I directed that myself. So it was Aaron and I uh, for four days just talking about it. 
And, you know, a big part of it is he's super talented. Um, so does he write as quickly as he speaks or, or is his dialogue? Uh, he, he, he actually does. I asked him that. Um, he, he can write a scene once he's got in his head as quickly as he can type it. Um, he can also remember everything he's ever written. He has an eidetic memory. And I kind of tested this and it totally worked. I said one line from um, the West Wing episode to Towers or something, that's Lord of the Rings, but something like that, to Citadels. Um, and he finished out the entire scene and I had the script in front of me because I wanted to ask him about it. And I was blown away. So this is a digression, but a fun one. So one of the things that I, I wondered about, because I, I love making things, I love getting in there and being able to create. So one of my questions was always, when somebody says to rewrite something, to revise something, and they say, hey, make the character stronger. Hey, make, you know, cut out anything else that's not uh, along with the theme. Where do you start with that? Like, what do you do with your cursor? And imagine you sit down and you're looking at your draft. What do you start a new document and literally start writing it again and make changes as you go? Do you delete things? Do you underline things? Do you cross things out? Uh, do you rewrite on top of it? Some people do that actually. They start at the top, rewrite down and then delete the next part. One of Aaron Sorkin's drafts, he rewrites from memory the entire screenplay. And it's funny because I remember on set, I'm just like, whoa, that's, that's uh, fascinating. And he's like, are you sure Aaron? And I'm like, Yes. Don't you think that's pretty <laughs> unusual that, that somebody would do that? And he's like, well, the reason I do it is because I'm lazy and I will skip the parts that aren't important to the story. So this is an amazing tool. It's not something that I can do uh, as a writer. I, I sort of write short fiction on the side. I can't do that. I don't have that, that memory for words. However, uh, I was a musician for nine years, so I could do that with the song. So it's actually a tool I use now. What if you rewrite something from memory? Does it cut out and make something uh, more accurate? So hmm. um, your, your original question was, you know, why, why do you outlier? So partway through doing masterclass, because the goal is to set this up, because I want to know how all these great people work. This is a masterclass is a product I want to exist just so I can take it. Um, and it was really sad that, that people like JD Salinger weren't around at the time. Uh, definitely felt some personal responsibility around you know, we didn't get to David Bowie or Prince. I mean, these are, are just people that we should have had, you know? Um, and I, I really wish they would have been able to leave behind sort of how they did what they did. So people would come in and they would say, okay, what's your, what's your four-year plan, right? These are job applicants. And I kind of got sick of this question. So I'd say, <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what the hundred-year plan is. And then I'll, I'll wind it back 96 years and we can talk about the first part. So the hundred-year plan is we want this out there. And we really, you know, it was a, a long road, but we got it to a spot where I could hire a great VP of product, great VP of engineering, exec producer, train up a creative team, and that people could exist out there making stuff. Now, keep in mind, I was the, <laughs> I was running content, product, and I was the, the CTO, right? So I was using both sides of my brain there. It was a burnout. I was tired. Um, I was so lucky that I was able to take a full year off too and think about what to do next. Got it. Got it. So uh, you're clearly a unique guy. Now, it, you know, I'm in the uh, position often of uh, teaching students who really don't know what they want to do in the future. They haven't thought about those factors yet. Teaching them entrepreneurship. I, I sometimes wonder, is it nature versus nurture? Is an entrepreneur like you born or can you make one? What's your view? That's an interesting uh, question. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I, I think in some ways, only now with Outlier, do I even really know what I want to do. You know, so I, I think one, students really should not be concerned by not knowing what they want to do. So in college, for example, my, my journey is like, go in for advertising, pick up computer science, start playing in bands. And then I'm like kind of hoping that maybe my geek rock band will take off or the industrial band I'm playing in Cambridge, et cetera. Um, that's like my plan. Right? I had no plan whatsoever. I'm just doing interesting things. And um, people kept saying, hey, you'll know by the time you're a, a senior. That it, you just, you're, you're figuring it out. You'll know, you'll know. So I get to be a junior and I'm like, I still don't know. This is very concerning. Um, and people are like, don't worry, don't worry. You'll, you'll know, you'll know. So I get to be a senior. I still have no idea. I take uh, T-Bar's um, law class. I love it. I decide I'm going to be a lawyer. 
Um, I tell the LSAT, it's a super fun test. Uh, and I start talking to lawyers. And the first one says, Aaron, whatever you do with your life, do not become a lawyer. And I'm like, whoa, that, uh, okay, that, that was intense. So I go to the, the next lawyer that I can find and I'm like, okay, what's, what's your story? And he's like, oh, I was a lawyer. I started a restaurant, uh, quit being a lawyer. And I write novels, it's awesome. And I'm like, oh, great. So, you know, should I go become a lawyer? And he's like, Aaron, whatever you do with your life, don't become a lawyer. And I was just like, whoa, okay, this is getting depressing. And I even asked T-Bar and he was like, yeah, I, I don't know if you're like the right personality for this lawyer thing. So I really had no clue. And it's, it's about doing interesting stuff in the meantime. I actually never thought of myself, I think, in an entrepreneurial way. I also never thought of myself as a creative until I got to college. That's something advertising gave me. And keep in mind, when I, when I look at my background, you know, as eight, my sister and I put together all the neighborhood kids to do a production of Cinderella complete with dry ice and a pink unicorn costume because it's the only thing we had for a, a horse for the carriage, you know, this sort of thing. There was a real entrepreneurial mindset, I think, early on. Um, but the identity of it is what, what really helped to change it. Same thing with creative. Even though I made all these films, even though I'd write music constantly, I never thought of myself as a creative until college when I went into advertising. And uh, I think it was, well, names escape me right now, but uh, somebody said, hey, so do you want to go into the account side or the creative side? And I was like, oh, what, what does what? And they're like, oh, the account side like manages the client, you figure out strategy, et cetera. The creative side, you're going to be, you know, art directing, writing copy, et cetera. I'm like, yeah, that's me. Oh my God, I'm a creative. <laughs> so it was very late in life. So I think people can change. I think people, I, I think entrepreneurs can be created. Absolutely. I think it's a skill set. Creating a company is a skill set. And you do get better at it, even though the main skill set is being good at things that you're not good at. First of all, I, I, I did dwell for a moment on your comment that the LSAT was a fun test. But moving on from that for just a moment um, and, and following on the question, I'm a little old school, as you know, and meaning I come from a time when the model was really start your career in a large company, learn the tech, learn the marketing, learn the customers, then go out on your own and disrupt an industry, become an entrepreneur. Is that still a valid model? It's clearly not your model. Um, I actually think if I had one regret about my career, I would have worked for somebody else for the first couple of years. I think you can learn an incredible amount working at a company, whether it's a startup or a bigger one, et cetera, about management. Maybe you're learning uh, about a better way to do it. Maybe you're learning about how you don't want to be a manager. But I think it actually took me a little longer to pick that up because I didn't go that route. So I would say that's, that's still a valid um, career path. But maybe not the same thing as like my grandfather, right? He went into DuPont at 28 or something and he retired from DuPont. You know, he's a company man. Um, I think, you know, I, I think there's a lot of benefits to that having existed. And I think in some industries it still does exist for sure. But as far as students interested in entrepreneurship, I would recommend finding somebody who you think is doing some really cool stuff and going and working really hard for them for a while and maybe making mistakes not using your own money. That's, it's a bit painful early on. Sure, sure. So, so while we're on the subject, let's move to that for a minute. I, I get a lot of call from uh, BU's alum, alums, starting companies or starting ventures, looking for funding. I, I know in, in uh, our prior conversations that you've gotten for your ventures almost every form of funding that one can imagine. Talk for a little about funding, how you go about getting it, um, who you take money from, because I'm sure you don't take money from everybody. Uh, what's your thoughts on all of that? Yeah. Um, so funding's a tricky thing. It's, it's something that if you're looking for VC dollars, which is not always the right solution, um, you really have to know people. So before we get to that part of the story, my first company was bootstrapped. So I was literally like eating expired canned food, sleeping on an air mattress with holes in it where you wake up and like, you know, your butt's touching the floor and you're like, well, this is not my favorite situation. Um, so believe me, the first $10,000 I made in business, I bought a bed, I bought a dresser, I bought a Sonicare toothbrush, and then I was out of ideas of things to buy. Um, <laughs> so I was like, okay, I, I don't know, hire some people, I guess. So um, I, I think bootstrapping is difficult. So I'll go through the different types of funding. So sure. bootstrapping, so really just uh, you put in a tiny bit of money yourself, 
Um, you know, sometimes you can go from scratch, maybe if you're doing kind of shutter stock, uh, you know, license stuff, et cetera. But then you take the money and you put it back in uh, to the business and you, you kind of get that flywheel going. So that's a delight because when you send, you sell the company, you're owning it 50, 50 with your co-founder. And that's pretty fun because even a small sale is pretty life-changing. Um, angel funding is the next sort of step, I would say towards VC. It's toe in the water towards VC where these could be people who are just, you know, lawyers, dentists with some extra money. Maybe they're entrepreneurs, um, maybe they're small business owners and they think what you're doing is cool. Um, and that's entirely personality based because you know your, your business the best. Yes, people are very helpful, um, but make sure that they're not applying their own framework so hard on you that it's, it's difficult. VC, VC has changed a lot over the years. And I gotta tell you, um, so GSV is my series A investor in outlier.org. And I should talk a little bit about the way I thought about funding there. Cause we've you know, taken almost a quarter billion dollars for, for masterclass at this point. Um, with outlier.org, I actually tried to fund it off foundations initially. I was like, okay, I wanna make education accessible. I wanna reduce student debt. That's my goal. Foundations must be the way to do it. And I won't name who I talked to, but I talked to basically a lot of the state-of-the-art foundations in the space, and they all said, wow, this is great. In 12 months, we can get you 200 grand. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, that's not, not quite the numbers I'm looking at to fundamentally change the way people learn. So finally, I actually just got sick of it and said, you know what, I'm going to self-fund this. I'll write checks until it happens. Let's make calculus. So I asked Mike, who I made blindside with, uh, quit your job, come join me. And so he quits, he joins me. A few days later, um, the VC, Michael Deering, called me. He was our first investor in Masterclass. And he was just like, what's this I hear about you getting money from foundations? Or like, what, what are you up to? And I told him, and he's just like, you know me, we can, we can make a real difference and make it with a real business. Um, how much money do you need for your Series A or for your, for your seed? So he was really my my one and only thought as a an investor because like you know he like he he brought like high school kids to master class you know what I mean it's like this he's this type of person and extraordinarily um, adept as a VC um, so we took seed from him um, with outlier we d I, I'm a solo founder this time around so I rely on my investors I need help. Um, you know, you need that when you have a co-founder as well, but it's especially the case as a solo founder because you, you just, you have a lot more deficits when it's just one person's sort of spanning set of skills. So uh, one thing that I absolutely love is if somebody brings me talent. So Julia Stiglitz is, is my fellow board member. Um, she came in with GSV. They are an education focused VC. So I, I already sort of knew a lot of the Silicon Valley uh, VCs. And I'm like, who is this GSV thing? You know, what, what's, what, are, what are they doing? And I just liked them immediately. And realized that my biggest weakness was in academia at that point. You know, um, I'm good at consumer marketing. I'm good at the, the business side, but you know, I didn't, <laughs> I, I didn't know where to start, you know? Um, and GSV was able to do things like, oh, you want to talk to the former president of Yale and uh, CEO of Coursera? Done. Here's Rick. And I'm like, amazing. They also brought incredible talent like Jeff Buning, my COO, um, and Julia Stiglitz, my, my board member. It's, you know, that those board meetings can be incredibly helpful. I look forward to it. Um, I bring my executives with me uh, to the meeting um, and we all just solve problems together. Sorry, long, th there's so much to say about funding um, because it is such a weird esoteric thing. But what I was getting to is VC is popular enough now that you're not stuck with just one profile of VC at this point. There's a lot of different flavors out there. There's a, a VC out there that's actually a B corporation and they make great returns. That just wasn't a thing before. And you can, um, it, it ends up making the discussions quite a lot more fun. <laughs> well, we're on the subject uh, and uh, we'll take more questions um, from the audience uh, later. But someone asked, um, is in, given what you just said, is Outlier a not-for-profit organization? It's a little confusing. They're apparently looking at your Glassdoor reviews, trying to figure out whether you're a not-profit or a for-profit. 
Um, Last door. So uh, I, I would recommend looking. We have an FAQ question on the homepage that discusses <laughs> this. So okay. probably a little a little more direct route than Glass Door reviews. Although I'm literally going to look those up after because we didn't have any. Uh, apparently, quite recently, we are a for profit. Um, I believe in market solutions to social problems. I actually pretty deeply considered starting uh, Outlier as a nonprofit. Um, I talked to a fellow BU alum who has a B corporation and talked B corporation as well. Um, you know, when it's a privately held company, you can be mission focused and be a for profit company. Um, and that allows you to accelerate, take money. Um, it also avoids a really critical problem that I saw in 2008 that was brutal. So I worked in nonprofits all through college uh, while I was in, in Boston. And when there is an economic downturn, uh, giving dries up. And if there is one place you should give, and I guess this is a BU pitch too, but if there's one place you should give during a downturn, it is in education because that's what people need. And if we were purely a nonprofit and we didn't have a market-based solution, um, that would be a critical concern amongst many other uh, concerns there. But yes, we are, we are a, we are a for-profit and I do highly recommend reading our statement on this because for-profit college was this horrendous thing. Think of that as sort of a brand name for something bad that happened, not an actual description of the for-profit versus nonprofit structure. Got it, got it. Well, let me go back just for a minute on the funding question. So, um, uh, let's assume for the moment that you're out uh, raising money for a new idea mm -hmm. and I'm the investor or potential investor. How do you screen me? How do you determine whether I'm somebody who meets your, your uh, needs or, or not? Yeah. Um, so I think about investors a lot like I think about members of my team. You're looking for a good fit in both directions. If if they're kind of you know pushing themselves to get to you, or you're kind of pushing them yourself to get to them, that's not necessarily going to work. Same thing with with team members. You know, you want somebody where you're really going to foster their career, um, even if that's ultimately not with you, etc. So, um, one of the things I'll do is I will check references. You ask them for references. You specifically ask them for ones that might be painful. So, look in their portfolio, find uh, a company that's just gotten brutalized recently, and then be like, hey, can I talk to the founder of so and so? Um, or of, of this company. Um, secondly, talk to companies that they don't give you the references on. Um, just because that's, the, the interactions with investors are incredibly short. This always blows people's minds how few words are exchanged between the portfolio company and the investor before somebody might invest tens of millions of dollars. So a lot of what you're carrying into that conversation is either a prior relationship with the investor. So I like to start so in general, when you're raising a round, you'll have people come in that aren't right for your round, but they're really cool. And you'll just be upfront about this when you're chatting with them. Hey, we're a little early for what you guys do, but you know, I think it'd be great to get to know each other. So when you're raising a round, the ultimate goal is you already know literally everyone that you're talking to. Now that's a, that's a big goal when you're first starting out, right? This is, this is a massive aspect of, of the privilege of having a track record. So when you're initially doing it, sometimes you literally will be making compromises with taking money from people that you'd prefer not to. But that's what those of us who are who come into the world without a network have to do. And you make mistakes. And you know, uh, you know I've I've had a bad investor before. Thankfully, not at a masterclass or outlier. Um, but it was rough. They can make your life very difficult, even if they don't have technical power over you. They have influence, hence that power and influence uh, dichotomy. So check with people. Um, it, they're, they're sociopaths are out there. Uh, they look like you and I, unfortunately. The really good ones, you can't tell. But you can tell because there will be sort of a trail of bodies. You're looking for that trail. Uh, the scariest thing is when you email somebody and say, hey, can you tell me about so-and-so? And you get an email back that says, call me. <laughs> uh. Because pretty much 100% of that time, that call is, run as fast as you can. And you will have had a perfectly nice interaction with that person. Um, so just put a little, little fear in you there. Um, but secondly, uh, look at the partner. You're going to be spending 10 years with this person. So number one for me is the partner above the brand of the VC. Yep. Two, the brand of the VC. It, that helps with your future rounds. Sometimes it helps with resources, but 
there's something to be said for sort of the Hertz we try harder. Get the you know kind of second place, and they they will work really really hard for you. Um, three, how deep are their pockets? Are you expecting them to do a follow on? It's really good just in case things go sideways for you to be able to, you know, you're looking at somebody who's got kind of half a billion billion dollars that they have access to, or they can say, hey, we can put in another ten at a on a convertible and get you to the next round or whatever, and then you'll be in a good spot. Um, and it looked like I was going to have a fourth one there, but as is my theme in this conversation, I've just forgotten it. Not a problem. Not a problem. I, so while we're on the subject of funding, what's, I, I know, I don't think you've ever experienced it, but what's your view of uh, accelerators and incubators? Uh, all yeah. over the country now, uh, hard to know, huh? It's it's hard to know. I mean, it's it's like anything. So there's another theory of funding. So literally watch the show Silicon Valley. It's like satire plus basically a documentary. <laughs> so it's the smoke and mirrors side of funding, right? When you, you really are just trying to kind of play this reputation game, et cetera, et cetera. That's where some accelerators can be super helpful. Now, some accelerators are just like a lot of good resources, et cetera, go with it. Otherwise, you're going for name brand. YC, still good. Still, still you know, it, it's... Definitely something that that people kind of smile on. I get emails all the time from YC-backed companies, and it does actually mean something. I'm annoyed by them because they should be emailing somebody else in my company, but whatever. Um, so it's really individual to the accelerator. I think there's probably quite a few out there that, you know, like anything, 90% of something in the market's not necessarily going to be good. So yeah, yeah. you, you got to watch yourself that way. However, don't forget that if you find one where it's got cool portfolio companies that are going through it with you, those connections, fellow founders, groups like that will last you the rest of your life. You know, it's, it is a lonely, difficult life doing this. Um, and it can be very hard to understand sometimes, uh, even from people close to you, if they're not going through very similar things. And I have had a huge amount of benefit in my life from having peer groups of founders at the same stage. It doesn't have to be your same industry. It's pretty cool. I had a group in LA where, you know, a bunch of really interesting companies came out of it. And it was like a guy who ran an industrial bakery, a guy that ran a film fund, um, you know, a woman doing um, uh, like brain training games, all sorts of fascinating stuff. And you'll, you'll hear ideas and you'll kind of move with it. Now, uh, you know, having a, a sort of, I would say large public success and then starting from scratch again is a different emotional battle. So sure. I have a few founders in, in my whatever contact list, whatever Rolodex is now, um, that are literally in the same boat as me. And you go through a whole other set of, you know, why, why didn't you rest on your laurels? What are I'm you told, doing? <laughs> I'm told that the primary motivation of a lot of serial entrepreneurs is proving that the first time wasn't luck. <laughs> that's um that's certainly I, I i could see that i mean certainly not for me that this is where like just the act of creation itself is pretty amazing and then this one this one's my spacex right Th this is my shot it essentially fixing something that was wrong with my own upbringing frankly um you know it's the whole idea that talent is equally distributed um but opportunity is not and that is uh that's a real problem well, let's talk about that a minute. Um, first, uh, in a little bit of an advertisement, going back to where you were, you'd be happy to know, and I'm sure uh, people listening would be interested to know, we yesterday had uh, two BU seniors yet, yet to graduate um, get accepted into YC with, of nice. all things, a space capsule company. Um, and, and by the way, have raised seed funding while they're students. So uh, we do have some... Can we digress for a second? What is a space capsule? Because I'm thinking this could either be a pill that comes from space. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I've, I've described it poorly, but a, uh, a low cost return vehicle to allow manufacturing in space. Awesome. Um, awesome. And something that um, I really don't know how you bootstrap, but they've managed to bootstrap it for quite a while. And wow. uh, we're really proud of our, our students. At any rate, let's go back to this issue about dispersion. And um, what about geography? We're talking to you, you're in Oregon right now, if I'm correct. Just, yeah, just across the river in Washington state. Yep. The, um, you know, we are accustomed to thinking about 
innovation and entrepreneurship occurring in basically three or four centers throughout this country, the Valley, Boston, New York, as I think actually surpassed Boston now. Um, what's your view? Is that going to be the, is, is that true now? Is it going to remain that way? Um, how has, uh, has the pandemic accelerated any changes? Yeah, the, um, the old joke is that you had to live, your company had to be headquartered within 20 minutes of Menlo Park for board meetings. I thought it was Kleiner Perkins, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> different, different eras in Silicon Valley there. <laughs> um, so yeah, Sand Hill Road, uh, all of them. So yeah, basically geography has changed and was changing before the pandemic. We're seeing really cool startup hubs in places like Colorado. You're seeing great companies come out of the Midwest. Um, they're, humans like being in the same room with each other. You know, it builds a lot of trust, even over video, right? Like the lower frame rates, I don't, I don't like. I find it more difficult to, to sort of read people and, and also for them to read me, right? Like I want to be readable, I want to communicate. And that, that is harder over video. But I do think that the kind of distributed nature of a lot of what happens in entrepreneurship uh, at this point in the information space, right? So the space capsule type stuff, right? Like uh, Rocket Lab is off the tip of Southern New Zealand um, for good reason. It's pretty hard to do it anywhere else except the tip of Southern New Zealand. Um, by the way, that is an amazing company. Um, but for, for the information space stuff, like outlier.org is fully remote at this point. It's a very hard thing for us to do um, in that just emotionally. <laughs> I mean, th this is these are some of the best people I've met in my entire career. I love being with my team. I love being in the same place as them. Um, but the pandemic made it so we needed to make sure people felt secure about going on, starting their lives other places, and they'd still have a job when everything opens back up and we, we can be back in person. But I think the pandemic has caused it so the whole traditional idea of an office is only going to exist in some industries. In the startup world, there's already been pretty good success stories in distributed teams. You know, one second every day, my friend Caesar Kuriyama runs that app. I, I think actually has a cousin that goes to BU or something. Um, you know, he's fully distributed with his team and it allows enormous flexibility. Now, I, I think this is all great in theory. So from yeah, an idealist, yeah. Yeah, from an idealist <laughs> standpoint, I love the idea of this happening. But from the practical standpoint, we need still more diversity in VC for people to get behind the idea of people in different places having great companies, um, you know, having good ideas and being able to go all the way. Um, and I think that, that VC has gotten better uh, over the years, but there's still a, a long ways to go. Because at the end of the day, it is one person looking at another person and you know, all the accoutrements, the spreadsheet and, and everything and saying, I believe that this person can make this happen. Because we, we all know in entrepreneurship, you come out with this great plan, um, you launch, everything basically just goes sideways. Um, opportunity ends up where you didn't think it was, et cetera. And it's, it's about the team adapting uh, to the new environment and succeeding anyways. So for Outlier, you know, we're cinematic film production, right? We're, we're very good at making ultra high quality film at about a 10th the cost, what you'd ordinarily spend. We use all sorts of tech, et cetera. Pandemic hits, we can no longer be in the same room. How do you make a film not in the same room? Well, a lot of people shut down. You know, one of my buddies is an indie film producer and he's like, man, I'm just, this is great. I just spend time with my kids now. Like I don't have any jobs coming up. And I was like, oh, wow, that's, that's awesome. He's like, well, what about you? I'm like, oh, we're still filming because we're crazy people. So our team is very talented and they figured out how to film completely safely using robots. So motion controlled dollies and, and automated gimbals inside spaces. So if you watch our intro to microeconomics and our intro to philosophy trailer, much of that is filmed with literally nobody on set except the talent. And then it's all remotely controlled from another room. If, if is, could, yeah. I'm sorry, keep going, keep going. I was just gonna say the conviction from the investor side that you have the adaptability to, to manage that is a huge part of this. And that's why we need people who can have confidence in all sorts of different people from different backgrounds, et cetera. I mean, I, I feel lucky coming from the middle of the forest with you know, a, a car that I had to repair every week and then it would occasionally catch on fire that I would be able to end up in an environment where people are willing to bet you know, hundreds of millions of dollars on, on what uh, I believe is possible. Great. Um, 
Let me um, interrupt for just a second and remind everybody on the webinar, we're, um, we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, and please submit your questions just through the Q&A on the bottom of the page or uh, raise your hand and we'll try by pressing the button there and we'll try and get your questions in. Um, while we're waiting for that, why don't you talk a little more about your motivation behind Outlier and where you feel the world of education is going? Yeah. Um, so Outlier, I mean, it, this is a deeply personal business for me. Um, now, the original idea was I didn't realize that it would be an entrepreneurial idea. So it was actually during college. Uh, it was too expensive. So I took community college courses over the summer and I would transfer in credits, literally including calculus. So I take them at Diablo Valley College in the East Bay and I transfer them into BU. Um, that was just sort of necessity as the mother of invention at the time. But when I went out and I started traveling the world, um, my goal was to understand where sort of the future of innovation was in the world. I'd never been to India or China or East Africa or Eastern Europe. It felt like these were huge gaps in my knowledge. And after, you know, already doing three startups, you're no longer naive. You, you, you don't, you're no longer functionally ignorant that it's a complete <laughs> nightmare to do one of these things. It has to really be worth it. So making sure I wanted to do something uh, was important to me. So I just started traveling. I ended up going to 28 countries. It was a great excuse to you know, learn scuba diving and fly a glider and you know, uh, get parasites and tear my Achilles tendon and just like have adventures. But what I found is that my story of education, and in this case, I'm specifically talking about Boston University, uh, fundamentally changing my position in the world is not unusual. I heard this everywhere. You know, everywhere from, uh, you know, in Cambodia, meeting this guy that had grown up in a fishing village, gotten a bicycle from an American NGO, went to a Buddhist temple in Siem Reap, learned English. And with that could make, uh, I think it was 220 bucks a month as a tour guide. Uh, and he can support his family of three. And he was so proud of this. And he was like, if it weren't for that bicycle that could get me into Siem Reap so I could learn English, it wouldn't be there. So education itself, is such a fundamentally important thing to all of us. And access to it is pretty abysmal at this point, to be, to be honest. So I thought about this blog post I'd read by Woody Flowers, who is an engineering professor at MIT. He said there's a million Calculus One students every year at the college level. It's actually more than that, but I haven't updated the numbers. They're spending on <laughs> average $2,500 per course. So that means Calculus One is a two and a half billion dollar a year industry. And 40% of those students fail. We're wasting a billion dollars a year on failed calculus, not to mention tons of time. So he said, why not just spend $10 million, make the greatest calculus course ever? Now, this is interesting to me because I love making courses, right? Masterclass was tons of fun that way. Mm -hmm. How would you make a great calculus course online? In fact, why is it $2,500 per course? That's crazy. Markets aren't supposed to allow for that. We know how to teach calculus. Right? It's been around for a couple hundred years. My favorite calculus book is from 1910, Calculus Made Easy. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, we actually use part of it in our calculus course. So I'm this a little means, disturbed that you have a favorite calculus book, but nonetheless. Oh, you, you and me both. <laughs> you and me both are disturbed by this. Oh. <laughs> um, so basically, I, I went out and tried to figure out why don't we have a great online for credit option? And I won't get into the whole thing, but there are a ton of very good reasons. A lot of very smart people tried this over and over. They're well-funded. Um, a lot of them tried it too early. You know, 2005 was not the time to be doing this. We still didn't really have broadband everywhere. Uh, so, you know, it ended up coming down to prestige, content, the lack of social interaction, the price, but ultimately students weren't succeeding. Right, so you saw all these MOOCs come out and students, they, they would tout, we have X number of classes and we have Y number of hundreds of thousands of students. Yeah, but how many complete? How many complete with credit? You know, uh, we realized when we launched, and by the way, I went out and just talked to the best learning scientists, et cetera. And we implemented a lot of what's already out there. That's already evidence back. Benjamin Bloom figured out a ton of this stuff back in the 60s and nobody, nobody took advantage of it. So bringing in our cinematic kind of style, our narrative storytelling, plus casting for the greatest instructors on the planet. I called 200 calculus professors to find Tim Chartier. That was our first one where 
He is a classically trained mime under Marcel Marceau. Talk about an odd combination. He's an absolute delight. Of course, his students love him. He's out of Davidson College, but he translates through video, which is a thing that is hard to select for. I'm very lucky because Ava Plass, our VP of video, and I have gone to work with some of the greatest actors that are alive today. So we know what works through video, which is different than what works in vaudeville, right? You wouldn't ordinarily put sometimes a film actor on stage or even in a classroom. It could be a complete disaster. That's why professors who are excellent in the classroom, there's a lot of bi-directional communication. So punchline to all of this is it works. We could tell the pilot semester, we were almost at the level of completion and completion with credit as in-person courses. After improving over the past year, we now meet or exceed that in our classes. This is the first time that has ever happened in the history of scalable online education. We have a question from uh, an alumnus related to this, and I'm going to go through some of the questions we've been getting. Yeah, in, and I'll try to keep I, my answers slightly shorter. Sorry. Well, it's okay. It's okay. It's very interesting. The, the, the first question, which is relevant to this, it says the hardest part of innovation and democratization in education may be doing high quality assessment of student work effectively at scale. How do you do that in your company? Yeah, so we, um, th this was, by the way, that was my initial thought. Um, when initially kind of thinking through this, this potential problem and ultimately actually talked to Ann Cudd, who is a Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at BU, who later became provost of the University of Pittsburgh, who is our partner uh, uh, for Outlier, which has been fantastic. Um, my first question was actually about cheating. How do you keep students from cheating? How do we assess them well? Um, well, it turns out there are some really good AI solutions out there for it, which is usually nonsense. Usually when somebody tells you <laughs> AI, crypto, whatever, you know, if you, you, can, you can hard roll your eyes and in general, you'll be right. This stuff actually works really well. So it turns on your webcam, records your screen and does gaze detection. So it can literally tell if you're looking off the screen, but instead of just saying, oh, this person must be cheating, it flags it and sends it to our own human team of proctors. So this is very important because some of these algorithmic ones were trained on data sets that are not necessarily diverse enough. So they're not outputting the same results for everyone. So you always want a human in the loop on that, which is the way we do it. So um, and I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't make that across the board that you always want that. For us personally doing this, this assessment at the college level like this, we do want it because we also don't want to annoy the students with it. It's always, we always have a human in the loop that says, yes, this is potentially a, a situation where there's cheating. So we've ended up with very high quality assessment. Um, and we do you know, have uh, psychometrician partners at the University of Pittsburgh and a number of other places. So we can also make sure that the assessments work well. I can go totally down a rabbit hole when it comes to raw scores and actually the best use of psychometric assessment, but I'm not going to put everyone through that. <laughs> well, we appreciate that. <laughs> let me let me ask in the, in the couple of minutes we have left, just a couple of more uh, questions from uh, people who are listening in. Uh, as you've said uh, already, mentorship is super valuable in entrepreneurship. How do you go about uh, finding and fostering mentor relationships? Um, so for me, actually going out and finding mentors for myself versus um, mentees, right? I, I have mentees now, and I do I do try to give about a, a half hour uh, of my week to um, helping out people earlier on in their careers because so many people helped me, right? It's, uh, you gotta send the elevator back down as they say. Um, but finding mentors was hard. It was hard for me. There's a real randomness to it. Um, I got lucky and I, when we started pitching our second company, uh, John Goldman, um, who started Foundation Nine, he actually did educational software back in the day. It all comes full circle. Um, does a lot of Walking Dead stuff at this point. But he just saw my partner and I pitch and he was like, these guys are interesting. So we were like, oh, do you wanna get lunch sometime? Um, and then it kind of develops from there. I Never once have I said, can you be my mentor? It's usually you tricking the other person into getting coffee with you and then having a discussion. And, and here's the thing, here's the trick. I, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna make a generalization here, but as I've gotten older, I have like, a little less energy. You know, I'm not quite as wide eyed. I'm not quite as, the world's not quite as sparkly as it used to be. There is something so nice about seeing a young entrepreneur that's just got stars in their eyes and they're ready to go out there and do something. Um, I think if you can show a little bit of that to someone, 
um, over a coffee or something, they're excited to, to help you do that because one, you know, reminds them of what the world used to be like, but also two, uh, it gives them energy too. It's just fun. It's fun to get outside your head. Uh, plus there's an altruistic side. So anyways, sorry, long kind of meandering thing on that. But um, I'm thinking back because like uh, Kenny Lin, who's this excellent, one, one of our team members now, but he came and saw a lecture that I did at USC and, and he tricked me into getting a, a coffee. <laughs> no, it, was, it was just like, hey, could I just like talk to you about what I want to do over the summer? Because I think I might want to do entrepreneurship, but I also might not. Um, it was a very clever, uh, a very clever thing. So anyways. Great. So in the two minutes we've got left, one last question. Uh, in your estimation, what are the top areas of growth from an entrepreneurial perspective coming like, out of COVID? Oh, coming out of COVID. I was just like, in the world? No. Um, I don't know is, is the short answer. I certainly hope there's a lot in biotech. This, these new mRNA vaccines are extraordinary. There is an article about reverse engineering the um, Pfizer vaccine, or sorry, the Moderna vaccine, I think, um, like its assembly code for a computer. I highly recommend reading it. You will marvel at the fundamental science research that's gone into this. Um, I think education, we, we started doing this before COVID. We knew this was necessary before COVID. COVID has shifted the discussion. So it's pretty amazing to see Ivy League schools coming into us as cold inbound emails at this point saying, hey, you guys are doing something pretty interesting. And we're like, thanks. They're like, let's talk about it. Um, and we're like, yeah, I, I guess we will. So yes, we'll see education, but I think, ah, this is too big of a question. That's a great question. And I, I wish I-, I <laughs> And I, I only gave you two minutes I, to answer it. <laughs> and I also know when I don't know, you know, it's like I'm focused on my own. Okay. Well, we're at the end of our time. I would say we did get one question uh, asking, um, will this be, um, uh, recorded and uh, available for future viewing? And the answer is yes. Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to thank you very much. It's a fascinating conversation. We could have gone for another hour easily uh, and hopefully will at another point in time. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it back to Susie just to say goodbye. And thank you, Aaron. It was great. Thank you so much, Jerry. It's always fun to talk to you. Thank you to, to BU for having me on here. And, and thank you, Susie, also for, uh, for the intro, intro and outro, as I was saying. <laughs> well, I have to say thank you, Aaron and Jerry, for that. This is like the most invigorating and inspiring, um, incredible discussion. I know everyone is like upset that it's ended. Maybe we have to get you on back for part two. And I just also want to thank you to the audience for your taking your time out today and for the great questions you all asked. And at the same time, you know, thinking about what Aaron said about education, thank you for supporting BU and, and, and all of the good work that's happening and the valuable programs that we're doing at the university. You really help make the institution a rich environment for the students and faculty, alumni, and friends. For that, we're, we're truly grateful. Um, we look forward to having you join us again in the future for keep an eye out at the BU calendar for some more events and check back as often programs are added on a regular basis. Um, take care and thank you once again, Aaron and Jerry. It's thrilling. Um, take care and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. <laughs>